G'day and welcome back to another episode of Painting Oswarn. In today's episode, we are talking about fur, and of course, we're painting the Ursus Warbear. Now, painting fur is dependent on a couple of factors, the first being the type of sculpt. There is usually two types of sculpted fur. One is a heavily textured and recessed version, which you'll find on models like the Broodmother and around the Ursus's head. The second type of sculpted fur is a more stylized version, and you'll find that on the Ursus's legs. Now this type of fur is actually my preferred type to paint, as it allows you to create your own textures without requiring sticking directly to the sculpt. For the overlay colour on the Ursus Warbear, I've chosen a dark teal. Now this is so we can have the environment reflected in the white fur, as well as a good base to work for some of the fabric we'll be painting. Let's get started. Thought I might start this episode just showing the overlay color and talking to color mixing, which is a big component of the way that I paint miniatures and also this particular figure. So you can see that I've mixed together two colors, a green from Chimera and a blue from Vallejo. Both of these colors have really strong pigments and I thought it would be nice to use them together for a base tone. So as is pretty common for me, I'm putting out all of my paints that I want to use in this process on the palette first. And that allows me to mix together colors as I feel they're necessary. And we're gonna start our very first mid-tone color by mixing together the light sea gray, the middle stone, and the same colors as we used on the overlay. So before I talk about color mixing, let's talk about this process. So there are two different types of sculpted fur. The first is a very stylized version of fur, which you can see very clearly on the thighs of the Ursus. There's just a sensation of fur sculpted into the musculature. This is an extremely fun and enjoyable type of fur to paint. And you can see the way that I'm approaching it is lots of short brush strokes, just allowing the brush to leave little micro details and little impressions of fur. This is really similar to all of the other processes I've shown with wood, with leather. All that's changing is instead of long strokes like we used on the wood, we're using lots of short stipply strokes. And instead of changing the direction based on the leather material, what we're doing here is we're looking at the direction of the fur and continuing our strokes in that same direction. I think the second type of fur, which you'll see around the Ursus's head and on other figures in the monster range, it's not quite as straightforward to paint in a really cool and interesting way. You tend to be a little bit more constrained by the actual sculpt itself. So here, what I'm actually doing is just blocking in this color mostly with the base tone that I mixed up. And we will come in later and add the detail of each of those individual furs. So let's mix up our first highlight. So the reason I've mixed colors here is what I want in my colors is to really talk about the environment and the the surrounds that the figure finds itself in. Now, I already talked about painting white in the episode on the priest, and this war bear is going to be another example of how much the environmental colors will influence a white. So this fur is going to be white, but you can see the colors we've used to mix it here are a green, a light sea blue, a ice yellow, and a pastel green. Each of these colors is certainly a high value color, but I wouldn't classify any of these as white. But what they are is similar environmental shade to what I'm trying to incorporate in the rest of the figure. So we've got greens, we've got warm yellows, we've got the middle stone, which is a really rich green, 
and we've got the light sea gray which is again more of a bluish tone all of these colors are working into that environmental piece and each of these little strokes that i am leaving a little bit underneath is building up each of those different layers of color to create the sensation that this white fur is existing in a slightly different environment. Now I chose the teal for the underlay color for this figure because I wanted to paint teal fabric and because I know that painting fur, particularly white fur, it tends to look good when you've got this greenish blue underneath. So each of these little areas we're starting to again consider the zenithal highlights we're focusing the light on the upper areas of each of these and making sure that we're leaving those darker tones on the underneath in some cases we're leaving a little area completely in green or blue and in other cases we're pretty much blocking in the whole area this is a really simple fun process painting fur but it does require patience because for it to look good you can't you can't cheat you can't go quickly you have to stay focused on each of these little little strokes lots of short repetitive strokes in the same sort of areas however it doesn't take very long for that to start to give a really good impression of fur I think the color mixture here is a really important part of building up these stages. If you were to take just a normal mid-tone and paint it straight over this, this base tone, then what you might find is that there's not enough blending between those two colors to create the transition. So by mixing through those stages and by mixing in a little bit of other colors like the middle stone green, we're creating more subtlety, which is going to help the overall finish. So the face, as I talked about, is the second type of fur. It's much more challenging to create fur texture on this type of sculpted fur. Usually... The fur itself will work best if you dry brush it. I haven't really opted to do that on this. In some cases here I've done some basic dry brushing but mostly I am trying to reinforce that that texture with lots of little brush strokes. On figures like the Broodmother which is a much bigger piece I will probably rely a little bit more on dry brushing but for this model, because it's centerpiece, because it's probably going to be a pretty popular model in our gaming group, I wanted it to look really natural and really effective as a fur texture. So we're going to mix up our next layer. And here we're going to use the two lighter colors, the ice yellow and the pastel green. You can see I've just added a little touch of middle stone there, which is going to help it create a really greenish tinge to the whiter color. I'm sure I've explained that multiple times, so I won't go over it again. Now, as we get lighter and lighter colors, we need to focus the strokes a little more fine detail and continue to place those on the raised areas. Now, because of the shape of these thighs, I'm also adding some smaller strokes down the very bottom of the thighs, mostly because I want there to be some sort of lighting bouncing off the metal knee pads. But again, it's the very clear direction of stroke, up and down. I'm not doing side to side, doing up and down. And that's helping to reinforce the texture of fur. So fur shares some similarities with hair and one of the important concepts around painting hair is starting big before going small. 
What I mean by that is if you paint your hair elements by going strand by strand, what you tend to see is an uneven and irregular looking shape. When you go and have a look at, say, a, a shampoo or conditioner bottle, what you'll see is that beautiful, silky, flowing hair. Although you have individual strands, the entire volume is hit with a specific lighting. So rather than going strand by strand from the start, what we want to achieve with fur is establishing the whole volumes light sensation, the whole volumes lighting, before we start to place those final strand elements, which is what will sell it as fur. This is an interesting concept that you don't see a lot of beginning painters latch onto, but if you go and look at some experienced miniature painters and their work, you'll see that hair usually doesn't follow those same rules of highlighting. So here you can see we are starting to dry brush a little bit more, although in this case it's more of a wet brush. The paint is fairly moist, but we are allowing the texture on the figure to actually catch most of the paint off the bristles. This particular brush that I'm using is a Raphael 8404. I've had a number of people ask. I use Raphael and Windsor and Newton Series 7. Most of my experiences with those two brushes, I definitely believe there is a big difference between cheap brushes and good quality brushes in terms of what you can achieve. I would recommend you wait until you spend $20 to $30 on a brush until after you know a little bit better how to look after it but it does make a difference. So our next highlight color. This is just a pure mixture of the pastel green and the ice yellow. No other mixes in there. Really precise brush strokes now. Very simple. Very considered placement of the lights. Nice thin brush strokes. It's much easier to do this when you have a good brush. You can see I'm starting to add a little curve into these lines as it's creating that very natural fur look texture and it's reinforcing the sculpt itself. Really easy to replicate a fur look just by following a few stages of this approach, you'll get a fantastic looking fur relatively quickly. So we're almost at the end of the painting fur process, but rather than use an airbrush to do some unifying lights, I thought we might just use the contrast paint through the brush in the same way that I use through the airbrush. So we're targeting the contrast paint on the lower areas of these blends. This is to reinforce the light coming from below and also the light that is reflecting off of the armor, which will obviously be a darker greeny blue color. So this contrast paint, I've diluted it with some Joe Sonia Magic Mix to help it flow a little bit more evenly. This will also just help it be dispersed on the surface in a little bit more uniform way. And all this is doing is taking that white color and helping unify it in with the environment and the other elements on the figure. As I said, this is normally a step that I do with my airbrush but just to reinforce the fact that this is not an essential part of painting, having an airbrush, you can see exactly how I approach it with a brush. To help speed up the drying time on this, I highly recommend using a hairdryer. The hairdryer will also help 
prevent the figure from... F the hairdryer will also help prevent this layer from drying a little bit shinier as the heat helps to dry it in a more even way. You could mix in different contrast paints into this. You could mix browns or even more pure green. Thinking about the environment is the key part. Let's move on to the final highlights. And in this instance, we are grabbing some white and we're mixing it into those two initial colors. You can see I've started to work on the other elements here by working on the fabric. And now we're moving into these last highlights with the whiter light color. This is the key focal point of this model, the fur, and the, the face is also the key focal point for the whole figure. So we want the lightest, highest value component to be that focal point. Now the exposure on the camera here is making that look very, very white. It is certainly quite a bright white, but the other element that is making it look whiter is the fact that the other areas around it are not completed. You'll see when we go to the finished version that having those other elements done in a darker color helps make the white look brighter again. So this is a really straightforward, simple process. Probably the only major difference between this and some of the other techniques like white and leather is really thinking about those brush strokes and doing really short, sharp, and slightly curved brush strokes to help reinforce the texture of fur. This is one of the coolest models in the range. I know everyone knows that already, but you want to try and do a good job on your war bear because she is going to make it into a lot of parties, I think. And that is the end of this figure and the lesson on fur. And that's it. This episode on painting fur on the Ursus Warbear has come to an end. Just a reminder, you can find full paint throughs on all of these figures that I've done in the Painting Oswan series in a separate playlist, which I've linked below. In our next episode, we are going to learn how to paint fabric. And for that, we have chosen the Avi Harbinger, or Avi, depending on your preferred pronunciation. And I'm really excited about it because it's one of my favorite models in the range. I look forward to painting it and I look forward to seeing you then. Big Dano, out.